Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to our talk, Java, a perfect platform for data science. Just curious, how many of you know what data science is? Only a few of you. How many of you do Hadoop programming? A few of you. How many of you do Java programming? Just kidding. That's good. That's good. All right. So thank you for coming. Um, so who are we? Uh, first of all, let me introduce Alex. Uh, this is Alex. Alex is a senior software engineer at uh, VeriSign. He's also a proud author of a new book called Hadoop in Practice, which is, which is released already, I think, right? And he's going to be doing book signing right after this. Uh, you can email him at grep.alex at gmail. Grep.alex, grep. That sounds pretty geeky, Alex. So uh, anyway, you can email him at grep.alex at gmail.com or Twitter uh, at grep underscore alex or grepalex.com is this blog right there. All right, thanks, Karthik. I'm going to introduce um, Karthik Shamsander over here. Um, he's a principal at Verisign. He's a member of the adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins University, where he teaches a variety of courses, including distributed computing, and a new one he just kicked off on Hadoop, which is pretty exciting. Um, his email and Twitter information is also there. I'm not going to repeat it because I can't. I don't want to mutilate his um, last name for a second time. So, All right. So what is the overall goal of this presentation? We actually have two goals. First, to clearly articulate this new field, this emerging field of data science that's happening in the marketplace, the bus that's around there. And then to illustrate the many technologies that is built on top of JVM, that is built on top of Java, that allows you to practice data science. When I talk about data science, people immediately say, oh, yeah, we do that in Python. You know, it's a great platform. But the, my, my goal here is to convince you that Java is actually a great platform for us to do data science. So here's the overview. First, we're going to talk about the data revolution. Then we're going to talk about data science in theory. Then we're going to talk about data science in practice using many of the Java technologies that's available in the marketplace. That's where we're going to be spending most of our time. And then summary, hopefully, if time permits, we'll do some Q&A at the end. OK, so let's talk about this data revolution. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last few years, you've heard the term data. You've heard the term big data. Uh, some of you may even heard the word data science. And in, in fact, many magazines have already started talking about this. Uh, this is Science Magazine talking about data. Uh, this is uh, Time Magazine talking about your data for sale talking about privacy, and then you have The Economist magazine talking about the data deluge. If The Economist magazine is talking about data, it must be something that's important, I guess. So, you know, if you really think about it, the data volumes are really growing. It's, it's, a, it's a fact. And the reason I've represented the data volumes as an iceberg is because if you actually look at the iceberg a little bit closely, you realize that although iceberg is pretty big, pretty massive, the reality is that most of its volume is right at the bottom. It's pretty much the same story with data too. Right? There's a lot of data in the marketplace, there's a lot of data that's coming in, but that's just the beginning. The next 10 years is gonna be a lot of stuff that's gonna be around manipulating data, data analytics, data intelligence, and things like that. So it's important to understand this. So there's data everywhere. Enterprises are generating a lot of data, New York Stock Exchange generates about a terabyte of data. Yahoo processes 24 terabytes of data. Facebook generates 22 terabytes of data per day. There's a lot of statistics and it's changing on a daily basis. The question is, where is all this data really coming from? Well, if you, if you look at your enterprise, you may have a lot of existing OLTP databases. You may have several products within your company, right? They're serving different kinds of customers. So in a, in a, in a medium-sized enterprise, you have all these different databases. You have user-generated data. You also have logs, system-generated data, and, and all this data comes in different shapes, different sizes, different forms, different schemas, structures. You know, just to kind of give you an idea as to where we are coming from, we work for VeriSign, and I just wanted to kind of give you an idea as to what DNS resolution is, but the point is what we are really trying to do with this stuff. So if you're a user sitting in a browser, uh, with a browser, and you want to go to www.cnn.com, um, you type in www.cnn.com, your browser has to figure out what the IP address is. Well, it so happens that when you type in www.cnn.com, there's a dot at the end which represents root. So it's www.cnn.com dot. So when you, you know, it basically talks to the recursive resolver and says, do you have the IP address for www.cnn.com? 
the, recur the recursive resolver says, I don't know what it is, but I can get the answer. So it goes to what is called the root name servers. The root name server says, I don't know what www.cnn.com's IP address is. It says, I know who might know the answer. So it actually redirects you to what is called the .com name server. And the stuff that's in blue is what we run. We run the A and J routes, and we also run the, uh, the name servers for .com. The .com says www.cnn.com. I don't know the answer to that, but I know who may know the answer to that. So it redirects you to cnn.com name server. cnn.com name server says, yeah, I know the answer, gives the IP address back. That IP address comes back to your browser, and then the browser makes a request, which is the HTTP request, to get the answer back. Lots of stuff happening there. The point I want to make over here is that the stuff in the blue with step number four and five is what we do. We have the domain name registrations for .com, .net, .cc, .tv, .name, uh, TLDs, and then we also have these resolution servers. We get about 65 billion queries a day. Within a second, we get about 1.2 to 1.3 million queries. Right. So there's a lot of data that's coming in, and we want to take this data and make sense of this. We want to pull in the data that's from the DNS resolution. We want to bring in the data from, um, you know, from the registration system, from websites, from links, all these things to try to make sense of why people buy domains and what are they doing with it. Just to kind of give you an idea as to what's happening in the marketplace, there is an actually a change in computing industry in terms of scale. If I compare my PC from 1984 to 2012, I had a PC at that time, one megahertz versus three gigahertz right now. You know, some of you have gray hair, you probably remember that, right? 256K RAM versus four gigabytes, uh, 15,000 time improvement now, 30 bytes per second versus one megabyte per second data transfer rate. When it comes to hard disk drive, Actually, the first computer I had didn't even have a hard drive, but I had to put some value over there so it's not divisible by zero. So it's one megabyte versus one terabyte of hard drive that I have in my desktop at this point. That's about a million time improvement. So the point I'm trying to make is in our own personal life, there's a lot more data that we have that we need to process, right? All these pictures and videos and all these things that you're taking. So there's a lot of data. That's just personal life. Think about what happens in an enterprise. In an enterprise, you have all these different systems and you want to make sense of all this data. You know, re the reality is that there's actually a shift in the marketplace, and I'm hoping to show you this particular shift. So if you look at the, 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 the timeline of the computing industry, I'm going to break it down into three different stages. So there was the first stage, which is the 50s and the 60s, where hardware was the king, right? You had companies like IBM, they touted their hardware, hardware they were the king, right? Um, they, and, and software was, it was important, but it was only important to sell hardware. To the extent that when they actually came up with the IBM PC, they said, we don't want to even write the operating system for this. They gave it to Bill Gates, and he wrote it. They didn't realize what a change, they're going, what a change he's going to do. And suddenly, software became important. In the 1980s and 90s, it was all about writing software in Visual Basic, Visual C++, and selling that software. Everybody made money that way. The 1990s changed, gave a shift. It was about the World Wide Web. It was about ubiquitous access. Let's put everything on the internet and now data becomes the king. If you look at companies like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Bitly, what exactly are they selling to you? Really nothing. They're giving you free services, but in turn, they're actually collecting data about you and actually caching it in the ad marketplace. So there's a lot of data science kind of activity that they're doing within the companies. So what I want to say is that there are two kinds of organizations, organizations that use data effectively, um, data-driven organizations, that are like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Bitly, which basically use data to make their money, and that's all they do, free services. But then there are other organizations that actually augment their business by you doing data science and data-related activities, analytics-like activities. Amazon.com is a classic example. I'm not talking about Amazon Web Services. I'm talking about Amazon.com. They sell books. They sell movies. But then they also keep track of every time you clicked on a link, every time you browsed up an item, they, they, know, they know every item that somebody bought. They know that if this person bought this item, they also bought that item. So they're using all that stuff to upsell and cross-sell. So there's an example of data science that's happening over there. Same thing with Netflix, the cross-selling that's happening. They're showing you all the different movies that you might be interested in. So wake up, guys. This is a data economy. We are in the midst of information science. Not long ago, data was expensive. Storing was expensive. There is no limit to how much value, uh, you know, valuable data that you can collect. And we are no, no, no longer data limited at this point. We are actually insight limited. Just to kind of give you an idea, this is actually a field, this is actually changing the entire computing industry. 
you know, it's changing the biotech industry, the linguistics industry, mining, finance, journalism, education. The slides are going to be available. And what I would like you to do is take a look at some of these, you know, presentations and videos. And I would like to concentrate on one specific video, this video on linguistics. There's a professor at MIT uh, that recorded every minute, every second of his child's life from the day the child was born until the child was five years old because he was a linguistics professor. He was a linguistics researcher. And he wanted to see how language develops. Notice even in the field of you know, regular normal science, you know, bioscience, he's actually using computers, data processing to do this work, so data analytics. So he's able to figure out how his child started saying the word baba to the, to the, to, to the word water you know, from the age of two to the age of five. So he's actually seeing how language is, is being developed. So it's pretty cool thing. So think about it. That's a video that's being, that has to be processed through some kind of a mass system. Think, 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 about, think about the size of video that might be that. So now let's talk about data science in theory itself, right? So what is data? So what I did was let's look at the, the dictionary. So I looked at the Merriam Dictionary, and one definition is factual, factual information. Yeah, we understand that. Factual information used as a base of reasoning. That's transactional data. Every time you do a transaction, that's factual information. But there's also a second definition. Information output by a sensing device or organ, useful and irrelevant or redundant information. You can think of this as access log files for your HTTP. In our case, the DNS traffic that we're getting 65 billion times a day. And that's information, that's data that we want to make sense out of. And then the third definition is information in numerical form that can be digitally transmitted or processed. Think of that as data analytics. Right? So we need to do all these, all these three things. So let's talk about traditional data analytics versus big data analytics. You know, you, you, you probably are saying, wait a minute, we've been doing data analytics for, for decades now. What's so different over here? Well, in traditional data analytics, you have clean data versus you're dealing with messy data and noisy data here. There you're dealing with terabytes of the data. Here you're dealing with petabytes of the data. Here you often know in advance the question that you want to ask, whereas in big data analytics and data science, you don't even know what question you want to ask, which means... You know, you can't even design your BI system, your data, data warehouse systems around the questions that you want to ask. Um, you know, there's no, there's, there's, there's no design here. I mean, you just store the data and then you process it later on. And Alex is going to talk about how you can use MapReduce and all those things to process this. Architecture doesn't lend for high computation. You've got single storage, single machine, uh, whereas here you need a distributed computing and distributed storage architecture. Typically, answers are factual in nature. Here, the answers are probabilistic in nature. You might you know, get into an accident, or you might end up buying this particular product. Structured data versus unstructured data, semi-structured data. When I say unstructured data, I mean, you know, things like, you know, JPEGs, movie files. And when I say semi-structured, I mean XML um, and HTML files. You deal typically with one or two domains over here versus you deal with dozens of different domains in big data analytics. For example, at VeriSign, when we are looking at the DNS traffic data for, for domains, we're looking at the DNS traffic data, we're looking at the domain registration data, we're looking at the different links that are happening through Bitly, the, through short, shortened links, we're looking at the actual content, we're crawling the website, downloading the content, and we're trying to put all these different things together. Notice somebody needs to understand DNS traffic, they need to understand access logs, they need to understand websites, they need to understand how URL shortening works, all those different things to do data, data analytics. So what is data science? Data science is um, using data elements in clever ways to solve iterative data problems, which when combined achieves business goals. There is another definition for data science that I would like to talk about. This is from Drew Conway. Um, he basically said there are three things that make up data science. One is hacking skills, which is basically programming skills. Java programming would be an example of that. Domain expertise, you need to understand the domain for which you're trying to do data science, whether it's the DNS traffic, domain registration, or whatever business you are in. Then there is math and statistics knowledge. That's also important when you do data science. Now, when you combine um, the domain expertise and math and statistics, it's traditional research. Researchers have been doing this for hundreds of years. When you combine your programming skills with domain expertise, you get into what is called a danger zone, which means don't ask your developers that know Java and Hadoop to do uh, data science. What you really need, and then, and then on the other side, if you take hacking skills and combine it with machine uh, math and statistics knowledge, then you get into this field of machine learning. If you want to do data science, you kind of have to do all three of them, right? You need to have a combination. So your team has to be made up of all these things, like people. So when it comes to data science, uh, there are different tools that make up da data science. And the cool thing is that Java has lots of products, lots of tools that's built on top of the JVM, on top of the Java virtual machine that allows you to do this. 
For example, if you're dealing with big data processing, uh, you can do Hadoop MapReduce. If you want to store a lot of data, you can use the HDFS. Of course, Hadoop uh, MapReduce is built on top of HDFS. If you want to store data in, real, in, in big data um, in, for real-time access, you can use something called HBase and Cassandra, which I'll, which, which I'll talk about. Uh, if you want to do data warehouse type analytics on big data, you have tools like Pig and, and Hive that allow you to do that. Uh, if you want to do machine learning kind of work, then you have Mahout project, the Weka project. Uh, if you want to do uh, R, statistics R-like thing, now there is actually integration between R and Hadoop that's available. And if you want to do uh, you know, visualization, we have, we, we have Java FX too. But the reality is that the, the, the difference between what the tools that we have before for doing data science versus what we have right now is the fact that scale becomes really, really important. All right, so Karthak talked about some of the systems that work well for data science. And what we're going to do now is we're going to um, you know, look, go into them in a bit more detail, and we're going to start with looking at how they can scale. So remember Karthak's slide when, when he had a big iceberg and it was kind of growing as the data volumes are growing? Well, this is kind of my version of that. I mean, I can imagine that when this person started you know, their delivery business, they probably had one box and two boxes, and the kind of you know, cycle there was probably plenty big for kind of like transporting these two boxes around, right? But as their business grew, as the number of boxes they had to deliver grew, you know, clearly that, um, that cycle there just isn't going to cut it, right? And, and that's the case today with um, modern hardware as well. Ten years ago, um, you know, we could have conceived that with the hardware we had then, we could probably stick all the data that we cared about at that time onto that one box, but that one box just isn't cutting up for us today. So what can we do about this? So um, this isn't something that's new. Um, Grace Hopper, who was one of the first um, programmers in the Navy over 50 years ago, one of the first programmers to work with large-scale systems, even way back then, she already kind of saw the writing in the, in the sand and was saying, look, I mean, our goal shouldn't be to grow out single machines. The goal should be to harness the power of multiple machines together. And that's really where systems like Hadoop really come into their own right. So um, Hadoop is based on papers that Google published um, over 10 years ago um, around how it was handling storage and how it was handling, how it was supporting its um, computational tiers. Um, and what ended up happening was Doug Cudding, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of Doug Cudding, but um, he invented Lucene. And at the time, he was working on NUT, which is an open source and web search and, and crawl project. And he was having scalability problems. He actually read these papers that Google's published and said that, you know, that would be a good fit for solving his own scaling problems. So he actually implemented them. That project became known as Hadoop. Him and Hadoop moved into Yahoo, and at some point, Yahoo decided to open source Hadoop. Um, so Hadoop is a um, technology stack written almost entirely in Java, um, and it solves a lot of the problems that you have when you're trying to design and write distributed systems. I mean, that, that, there's a lot of challenges that, that um, you need to solve if you're going to do that. Um, and, and the key thing here is that, I mean, not only has Hadoop made inroads into the high technology companies that you'd expect Facebook and Yahoo to be using it, but you know, it's made inroads into, into financial health sectors. And at this point, pretty much all of the Fortune, the top Fortune 500 companies are using Hadoop in some capacity. So that will give you a sense of the kind of inroads it's made. So, um, you know, Doug Cutting, who created Hadoop, he likes to call Hadoop the kernel of big data, the kernel of distributed computing. And when you look at the Hadoop's ecosystem, I mean, you can probably realize why he's saying that. So first of all, you've got a number of other tools outside of Hadoop, which make it easier to work with Hadoop. And then beyond that, you've got tools that either use Hadoop for storage or they use, or they kind of move data in from databases to Hadoop and vice versa, um, or they move your log files into Hadoop. And Hadoop has really matured to the point now where there's a number of commercial organizations that provide not only commercial distributions of Hadoop, but also support, which is important for enterprises. Um, so what does Hadoop look like in a single node? Well, here's a single node, your typical mid-tier rack server, 24 cores, 48 gigs of RAM, 12 terabytes of storage, nothing too surprising here. Um, so this is Hadoop storage tier, um, HDFS, and it provides a logical interface to the Hadoop file system and then internally organizes the physical storage that you have on your server. 
and then the computational tier that sits on top of it, MapReduce, for the most part, um, it's a distributed um, processing framework, and for the most part, it's going to be reading and writing data via HDFS on that same node, in, in the best case scenario. So one node, not particularly interesting, right? But, I mean, if you look at the numbers in the bottom right there and see what happens um, when you add, you know, more nodes, here's a 20-node cluster, here's a 100-node cluster, right? And then here's a 1,000-node cluster. And 1,000-node clusters actually do exist in, in organizations such as Facebook and Yahoo. That's a lot of cores, a lot of memory, and a lot of storage for you to solve your problems with, right? And the key thing here is that they're all working together in parallel to solve your problems. So um, let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into um, the Hadoop distributed file system. So the first thing I want to call out here is, a fa is the fact that it's written in Java. I mean, who here 10 years ago would have thought any file system would have been written in Java? I mean, I, I, I certainly wouldn't have thought that. And I, I think kudos to the Java team really for have building you know, um, the garbage collection and all optimizations and the bytecode optimizations um, to allow us to actually have a file system in Java. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so what does um, what does Hadoop look like, or what does HDFS do when it's storing a file that's maybe at one gigabyte in size? So the first thing it's going to do is actually going to break that into blocks. And for a file system, these blocks are unusually large. They're at least 64 megs in size, and if not larger, if you're dealing with larger clusters. And then let's imagine we've got a four-node Hadoop cluster. The first block is going to be written onto three nodes. The second block is going to be written onto another three nodes and so on and so forth. And, and there's a couple of good reasons why there's more than one copy of each block here, right? First of all, distributed computing, you've got a large number of nodes, nodes are gonna fail, right? So you don't wanna have only one copy of data in your cluster. But the second reason is actually that of performance, right? When MapReduce is actually optimizing and deciding where to push work, um, if, if there's um, overloaded nodes in the system, it can actually push work to nodes that are um, not so overloaded. So having multiple copies of data lets it do that. So in terms of throughput, I mean, the modern, you know, day, you know, rotating hard drive, I mean, the best case read-write, sequential read-write rates are probably looking at about 150 megabytes a second. I mean, that's, that's not bad, but it's kind of like, you know, the caveman trying to light some fire, right? It's not, it's not particularly impressive. But, you know, obviously when you've got a thousand of them in parallel, it's 150 gigabytes a second. I just want to pause here for a second. I mean, 150 gigabytes a second, I mean, think how much data you could read and write at that rate, right? That's, that's a lot of data. All right, so let's switch gears here and talk about MapReduce, which is a computational tier in Hadoop. So again, it's written in Java. Um, it has underpinnings in functional programming. Um, you know, um, Google, when they published the MapReduce paper, they were one of the first people to really um, talk about MapReduce as a concept. It's existed in languages like Lisp for quite a while now. Um, I like to call it a shared nothing programming model. I mean, with distributed computing, one of the challenges is that you gotta be, you're, you're constantly trying to defeat Amdahl's law, right? You're trying to make your, your work as parallelized as, as possible. And in shared nothing architectures, that's a lot easier to do than in architectures where you've got to do distributed locking and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, the key thing here is that MapReduce solves a lot of the problems you get with distributed computing, right? I mean, things go wrong all the time. I mean, on a daily and weekly basis, drives go wrong, you know, and um, racks can go down. I mean, all sorts of chaos can happen in your data centers. Um, so MapReduce handles that all for you seamlessly, which is actually really important. Um, so what kind of things can you use MapReduce for? Well, when Google published their paper, I mean, at the time they were using MapReduce to create their web search index. Um, but you can do things like searching, sorting, graph traversal, create your Lucene indexes, and machine learning. So let's look at the map reduce functions and what they do. So here's a map function. It's pretty basic. It takes in, as, it takes in a key value pair and it makes a key value pair. That information gets routed to the reduce function, which again takes a key, a list of all the values for that key, and once again outputs a key value pair. So let's, let's take a step further and look at um, the situation where you maybe have one file, you've got multiple blocks here, and, and the parallel nature of MapReduce here is the fact that you can have multiple map functions working on the same file in parallel. And the map function, you can do things like, you know, filter, projection, kind of standard things. 
you're, you're going to output your values. And then, you, you know, what's really happening in the middle here is what I like to call the shuffle phase in Hadoop, where um, there's a guarantee with MapReduce that for every unique key that's emitted by the map function, that each value is going to be supplied to, the, to that reducer in that list there. And then in the reduce, it's very common to do things like aggregation, summarization before you emit the final output. So if we were to compare relational databases, which we're probably a lot more familiar with, to Hadoop, and trans you know, how about we use transportation as an analogy for that? So a relational database is kind of like a sports car, right? It goes zero to 60 real fast, and but can probably handle, you know, carry about one or two passengers whilst it's doing that. Versus Hadoop is kind of like a freight train, right? It can carry a large number of passengers, um, but it's going to take you know, a while to get up to speed. The other way that they um, fundamentally differ is that um, relational databases is, is much more of a real-time system. Hadoop is more of a batch-based system. Um, relational databases, they really excel at structured data versus with Hadoop, and um, they can support unstructured data as well as structured. Um, relational databases, for the most part, unless they were designed from the beginning to be parallel, they, they tend to scale only so far versus with Hadoop, you, you, it's a truly linear parallelism that you get as and when you add nodes to it. So a question that's often asked is, you know, how does Hadoop fit into my organization, right? So what tends to happen in a lot of um, production um, applications is that they tend to be siloed. They don't tend to talk to each other very well. So a great way of using Hadoop is a mechanism to, you know, get all the data into Hadoop, join your data together, and then what you can do is you can actually, you know, take learnings from that, feed it back into your OLTP database, like you can see on the left-hand side here, or you can move some of the summarized data into your um, OLAP database where you can use existing BI tools as you do today. Okay, um, Alex makes up a really good point about Hadoop, how you can you know, if you notice the backdrop has uh, Hadoop in it and you have all these, which means basically for your enterprise, you have a Hadoop system which is bringing in all the data and then you, from all these real-time systems and you process it. And then you do, you write these MapReduce programs and, and uh, Alex is going to talk some of the more, more examples in, in the future as we go through. The point I want to make here is that, you know, yeah, you can do analytics like that, which is really good, uh, but we also want to do uh, real-time analytics, real-time processing. So how do you do that? Uh, well, typically, traditionally, the way we have done this is we would load all of our data into some kind of a relational database, data warehouse. I don't know if you were here yesterday for the Apache Cassandra talk. Uh, uh, how many of you were here for that talk? Right, so basically, Jonathan Ellis talked about how he has the, the analytics cluster. So one of the things that you could actually do uh, is use another technology. But before you do that, i got to do some database uh, bashing. I know it's an Oracle conference, but uh, what can I do? Uh, so database architectures have really not kept pace the last 40 years. It's pretty much the same. You have a big storage, a big you know, uh, machine that does all the uh, processing. Uh, and you know, we as application servers know how to scale applications through the different application servers, but when it comes to databases, it's about you know, growing the database by throwing more money at it, right? So you scale it uh, vertically by you know, more CPU, more memory, more hard drive, more storage, all that stuff. Throw more money at it. But there comes a point where you just cannot do it. And this is all about big data analytics, and you just can't do it in, in a single machine. Um, so, you know, what you really need is a horizontally scalable uh, database, um, so where you can add databases as you as you grow, just like the way we do it for application servers. It's time to take over from the DBAs, I guess. Um, sorry, if there are any DBAs over here. Uh, the, the reality is that there is actually um, a, a phenomenon that's out there right now called NoSQL, or no SQL, which doesn't mean no SQL. It really means you know not only SQL. So let's go beyond SQL. And there are many reasons why it's called that. But you know what I want to do is I want to talk about two very specific technologies that's built on top of Java. Uh, MongoDB is also no SQL, which is done in C++. But two different technologies that's built on top of Java that you can use today for storing big data and then retrieving big data. So one is Apache HBase which is uh, a distributed sparse column-oriented database based on Google Bigtable paper, just like the HDFS is based on the GFS paper. Uh, it leverages the HDFS distributed file system. And the other one is Apache Cassandra, uh, which is a distributed sparse uh, database, eventually consistent column-oriented database. It's actually a love child between Dynamo-based uh, database versus Bigtable database. It brings in the functionality of both of them. Um, it's, it was actually open-sourced by Facebook in 2008. Two really great databases. We'll, we'll talk about the details of that. 
So let's talk about HBase. So uh, we Alex talked about Hadoop, and uh, you know it has its own internal architecture, name nodes, and things like that. But I wanted to talk about uh, HBase. HBase is built on top of Hadoop. Uh, it uses the distributed file system, which is the Hadoop distributed file system. And in HBase, there's something called an HMaster. Uh, typically, when you have to scale a database, you know what, what do we do? We shard it. So HMaster is the master shard keeper. And then what you do is there are all these different machines. These different machines have what is called region servers that they run, which is where all the different partitions are kept. Right? And now you can have more than one H master because you want, you want availability. Uh, but then if you have more than one H master, which one is going to be the master? Well, in distributed computing, there is something called Zookeeper, which is an open source project, which basically keeps track of, and it's usually an, an odd number, kind of you know, this voting that takes place. And basically it keeps track of which is the current master. So when an H master goes down, the other one will be elected as the current master. So the idea here is that you have a you know fully distributed architecture uh, for storing real time data on built on top of HDFS. And when a client wants to read or write a record, it simply goes to Zookeeper, figures out uh, where the H master is, and then goes to H master, figures out where the shards are, and eventually talks to the appropriate region servers, which is where the different shards are, to do reads and writes. Now all this stuff is done for you automatically under the hood. In the same way you have Cassandra, you know, I like Cassandra from the perspective that it's an architecture where every node in the architecture is equivalent. All nodes are created equal. There's no master-slave architecture here. So here the concept is that, you know, you, you have nodes in a ring. Everybody maintains a shard. And when a client uh, wants to write a record, it can talk to any one of those things because all nodes are created equal. It says, I want to write a record. The Cassandra daemon then says, okay, I'm not the primary owner of that particular record, that particular key, so it basically proxies and, and you know, attaches to the Cassandra daemon that is the owner, writes the record over there, which ends up writing to the next two nodes in, in a round robin in a fashion, and you got it done. Uh, in the same way, if you, you can have multi-data center deployment now, and you could do writes in, in, in both locations, and when you do, um, when, you, when you write, a copy of it is also written to the other side, and replication takes place. And if you if you read the Cassandra architecture, they talk in great detail about this, and it's a pretty cool architecture. But for real time data, it's it's great for us, whether if it's if, even if it's within the same data center. Okay, so performance and scalability very easy to uh, improve performance and, and and scalability. You know, you need more partitions, just bring in another region server. Automatically, the sharding takes place for you. You don't have to worry about that. Um, when it comes to performance and scalability in Cassandra, um, you can add another node. As soon as you add another node, uh, basically everything gets automatically registered in the background, so you're able to uh, scale your uh, Cassandra architecture. Okay, so now let's talk about data representation in, in general. So we talked about scale, both MapReduce processing, batch processing, and real-time processing. Let's talk about data representation. When you want to represent data, if it's Hadoop, um, you know, you look, you represent data in HDFS file system, which are really files. And so it's, it's, a, it's a flexible schema here. Even in HBase, it's a flexible schema, which I'll talk about. If you, if you have databases, it's a very rigid schema. If you have to do something, you have to change the schema. And, you know, altering a da table is, may, may take hours sometimes. Uh, there's no concept of indexes over here. Files can be stored as CSV files, pipe files, Avro, JSON, whatever you want to do, different formats, whatever format you want to store your files in. Um, and, it, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty cool idea. And then if you look at uh, HBase and Cassandra, they actually have this concept of uh, a key space, uh, which, and they have this concept of column families, and column families have key value pairs, and then you can have in Cassandra, super column family. So, you know, they have a, uh, you know, a kind of a, a very flexible architecture where you can have, you know, column names added on demand, on fly, as you go through. So you can have families. Families are ones that don't get added uh, on demand, but the, but the columns uh, can be added on demand as you go through. And there, here's the data model that allows you to do that. So you have a key with a bunch of name ID attributes that go into the database. And then if you, if you look at uh, Cassandra, in Cassandra they actually have a combination of Cassandra with Solar, uh, which, is, which is part of Datastax, that allows you to do queries, SQL-like queries, using something called CQL, which is, which is the Cassandra query language, so you can actually do data analytics. How about it crashing? Do you have your presentation on that?
what I'm going to do here just a second because we have a yes minus EF grab you want to swap it over? Yeah. Okay. We'll just So in distributed computing, hardware fails. No problem in this architecture. It, you have redundancy built into it. And uh, we wanted to show that to you over here. That's exactly <laughs> the reason. So that's what happens in Hadoop and HBase and all those different architectures. <laughs> Machines crash, no problem. Everything works automatically. <laughs> sort of. All right, so. Oh shoot, now what's going on? X out of this. All right, hopefully we're good now. Um, all right, so we've so far looked at scaling and how to do data representations, so we're gonna now look at analytics. Oh, you can, it crashed in mine as well. <laughs> What's going on? Huh. Sorry, hold on one second. Let's see if we can continue here. Uh, all right. Um, so um, let's talk about analytics in a, in a, um, in a scope of social networking. So, you know, social networking, you may think, you know, well, that's only, you know, only Facebook and Twitter need to deal with social networking. But what's really happening today is that, you know, more and more um, websites such as Toys R Us are beginning to use social networking as a mechanism to, you know, can have better engagement with our customers as well as to really help customers communicate with each other. So, um, what we're going to do here is we're going to assume we have a small social network of five people. And, you know, what kind of interesting things can we find out about our little network over here? Well, and let's look at Ali. So Ali has a couple of friends, Joe and Dee, and then Dee and Joe also have a couple of friends, Bob and Kia. And so one way that we could keep Ali more engaged on our website would be to recommend Bob and Kia to Ali because they are friends of friends, right? Um, so on a small social network like this, you can it'd be kind of simple enough to come up with a solution to do this. But the question becomes, what if you have? How do you come up with a solution that's going to scale to millions of? users in a social network, right? And that's where an algorithm called Friends of Friends in combination with MapReduce um, come into play. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna assume that our network is an undirected graph just to simplify things a little bit. So that means that, you know, if Karthik's my friend and I'm also Karthik's friend, right Karthik? Yeah. Thanks. And, um, <laughs> thanks. And um, you know, what we're going to do is in shared nothing frameworks like MapReduce, really the best way of modeling an undirected um, a graph is using an adjacency list. So what ends up happening is that um, each user will be represented as, as, as a node here, and that node will have an adjacency list containing all their um, first degree relationships. So in a MapReduce implementation, what ends up happening is that in a map phase, we already can figure out some of the second degree relationships. And you can basically do that by doing a Cartesian product of everyone in that adjacency list. And then what we're gonna do on the reduced side is that we're gonna filter out any first degree relationships. And at that point you have the complete set of all, sec of all the second degree relationships. And then we have an optional last step here, which is really an optimization to kind of give high level um, quality of results to to, the, to to each user. So what we're doing here is that, you know, ostensibly the more friends that you have in common, the more likely either you're going to know that second degree person or, you know, hopefully have some um, other things in common that will make you, you know, prefer to add them to your network versus someone else. So if we look at the map function here, if you remember earlier, the inputs of the map function are a, a key value tuple. So the key in this case is a user and the value is a white space limited um, list of um, your adjacency list, which is the other users you are connected to. So the first thing that we're doing down here is that we're extracting all the friends, we're tokenizing, and we're going, all the we're going through all the friends and we're emitting, the we're emitting the fact that there's a first degree relationship. 
And then we're doing at the bottom the Cartesian product and emitting the fact that this is a potential secondary relationship because we don't know at this point, but it could be. And then the reduced side, remember that um, all, the, all the keys and all the bias, the keys are going to be sent into one reduced invocation. And so what's happening here is that the, t the, the key is, is, a, is, a, is really a tuple of um, two users, which is a potential secondary relationship. And the values is a list of values. One indicates first degree, and a two indicates, indicates second degree. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through. We're going to look through all the values there. If we see a one first degree relationship, we don't care about that. We're going to discard that. Um, for all the other ones, we're going to count the number of friends they have in common. And then at the very end, we're going to emit the fact that this, this really is a second degree relationship, and this is the number of friends you have in common. So um, I'm going to do a shameless plug for my book now. Um, I talk a little bit more in detail about how this actually works. Um, but in all seriousness, I mean, you can actually, the complete source code for this is on GitHub if you want to go take a look at it. So another thing that's happened in Hadoop is, um, you know, much like with the JVM, now you have a bunch of different languages that kind of sit on top of the JVM. The same is happening in Hadoop as well. So, you know, Hadoop is, um, you know, like Duck Cutting says, it's a... It's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's a core now, and what you end up happening is that you have languages like Pig and Hive, which is probably the two most popular abstract languages that sit on top of MapReduce. Um, they they kind of sit there, they have their own DSLs, and what ends up happening is that they translate the DSL that you write into MapReduce and manage that whole process for you. So it's a lot, it's a lot simpler than working with the Java MapReduce at a lower level. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at an example of how we can find bad IPs in your web log. So here are some Apache web servers. They're generating a bunch of access logs. And you know, an entry in the access log typically will have information about the client IP, the path that's being requested, and the HTTP status code. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get that log data into your Hadoop cluster. And there's a great tool out there called Flume, which lets you do just that. It's a, it's a log. Um, collection and distribution framework. And then once you do that, you can then start using Hive to issue some queries against your data. So Hive um, QL, um, it's a DSL very similar to SQL 92. Um, and so the first thing we've got to do, just like you've got to do in regular relation database, is kind of like represent your data. So this is the syntax of your Hive um, kind of like um, construct here. So you've got create table. Looks pretty familiar, right? Um, you need identifying the name of the table. You've got a bunch of field names, the types for each field name. And the only deviation here really from SQL 92 is the fact that you're telling, because Hive doesn't know how your data is structured, so you've got to tell Hive you know, how your fields and records are delimited. So here you're saying, well, my field is limited by the tab character, and by the way, my data exists in this directory in HDFS. So let's write a real simple query here to kind of find you know, the, most, the, the most popular IP addresses are you result, making requests that result in four or four status codes. And, and at this point, this is pure SQL 92, right? We're selecting from a table where a status code is equal to some value, we're grouping by something, and then we're ordering by something. So you could probably copy paste this into a relation database and it'll work just fine. So, you know, Hive and Pig, they're really wonderful tools for, for non programmers. And there's a lot of people in our organization that aren't necessarily programmers, but we want to give them access to data in Hadoop. So Hive is really a great way of doing that. Um, who in this room has heard of R as a programming language? Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> that's more than I was expecting. Um, that's cool. I mean, so R, I mean, as a lot of you already know, I mean, it's a language that's used by mathematicians, by statisticians. And the reason that people, you know, that community tends to use R is because of the fact that it's got a really large amount of packages that have pre-built you know, um, linear modeling, classification, clustering, statistical tests. There's a bunch of packages you can just download and start using out of the box. So that's why the R community is as big as it is and as, as, as thriving as it is. Um, and, the, and the really great thing is that, you know, p the, those programmers that are familiar with working in R, they can actually use R in conjunction with Hadoop as well. And, and there's a couple of ways this can happen, and we're going to talk about one use case where you use something called Hadoop Streaming. So Hadoop Streaming, you're going to write your R script on your client side, you're going to use Hadoop streaming. That's going to copy that R script onto all each and every one of your nodes in Hadoop. And the way Hadoop streaming is, works is it's really a way by which any kind of process, any application that can read data from standard input and write data to standard output can actually be involved in a MapReduce job. So what, what, what's happening here is that in MapReduce, 
is, is getting your input um, tuples, it's feeding them to your R script, you're gonna be reading things from standard input, um, things are tokenized by the tab character, you can do your processing, you can write it to standard output, and then Hadoop will take over from there. So ours, this is a really nice way of, you know, an existing programming language working with Hadoop together. All right, and now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about machine learning. So um, machine learning is really the ability for computers to learn without being explicitly programmed to do so. And, and the, the first example of this is probably back in the 50s, Arthur Samuel, who was working for IBM at the time, he wrote a program that would play checkers, it would learn the winning and losing um, strategies um, after every game, and then it would apply these learnings in playing the game again. So this is one of the first examples of artificial intelligence at play. And what's interesting was that when IBM publicized the fact that they had someone that had done this, the IBM stock you know, went up 15%. So this was big news back then. But when we're talking about machine learning, there's kind of like three broad categories it tends to fall into. The first one is supervised learning. And you know, email spam detection is a great example for this. With supervised learning, you have what's called labeled data. Labeled data in the form of spam email would be a bunch of emails where for each email you have an indicator whether, whether or not it's spam or ham. And, and what ends up happening is these supervised machines, you know, they will look at them, they'll look at keywords that are, that are occurring more frequently, less frequently in spam and ham, they'll build a model, and then they'll apply that model onto unseen emails to do um, spam detection. And this is pretty much how most spam detection um, solutions work today. But other applications for supervised learning include handwriting recognition, speech recognition, face recognition. There's a whole bunch of um, disciplines that use um, supervised learning. Um, unsupervised is a, lot, is a lot more challenging. With unsupervised learning, you're not telling the machine anything about your data at all. You're just giving the machine a bunch of data. And you know, one of the more common algorithms called clustering you know, we'll basically look at that data, try and infer some relationships, and come back to you with a bunch of clusters that you as a human then need to look at and understand, okay, so if the machines told me this, there's this cluster of data, you know, how are they related? So there's, there's a lot of human effort involved in this as well, but the, the machine definitely helps come up with these correlations, these, these kind of data points there. Um, and then finally, you have collaborative filtering, right? This is something that we see every day when we go to sites like Netflix, um, and, and Amazon, um, they'll recommend movies based on what you've bought, what other people have bought, you know, how it thinks, um, you know, th these, these products can kind of coexist. And it looks at the bottom, like, I pulled up from my Amazon, someone must have hacked into my account and, you know, was clicking on romance novels then. I, I don't know how they got there, but I'll need to look into that, I guess. Um, but but the, the big challenge with machine learning has always been that of scaling. I mean, in the scientific community, community, there's a bunch of tools that do machine learning, but none of them scale particularly well. So Apache Mahout is really the project. Again, it's a built from the ground up to be a scalable, predictive analytics, machine learning set of libraries. Um, you know, most of the algorithms in Mahout are, are distributed, so they can actually work on a standalone machine as well as within the context of a MapReduce cluster. Um, and there's a bunch of algorithms there. I think there's, there's almost 50 algorithms there um, across the three kind of disciplines I touched upon there. Unfortunately, we don't have much time to go into them in much detail, but there's a great book, um, How in Action, which kind of goes into that in, in detail. And I also talk, I spent a chapter talking about it as well. Thanks, man. Yeah, it is. Okay, so, so I would like to talk about visualization at this point. I mean, yeah, we talked about data, we talked about data analytics, but if you give a report to somebody and say, here, you know, here's a one-page report or a 10-page report, it just, just doesn't look good. I mean, it's, it's, you know, people are not going to read it. You've got to tell a story. And so there are a lot of tools available uh, that allow you to do that. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that when it comes to visualization, I haven't really done much work on visualization uh, myself. You know, usually when I think of visualization, I think of HTML and JavaScript and Ajax. But to do visual visualization, something like this, you know, it requires uh, some uh, some other kinds of tools. Um, and what I suggest is that you know, I think JavaFX. I'm not selling JavaFX. I know when you say JavaFX or EJB, people start walking out. But I do I do have to say that I, I did attend a couple of sessions on JavaFX. It seems like it has a it has a lot of potential. It has a lot of you know drawing capabilities and things like that. And I'm sure people are going to be working on 
visualization tools that's built on top of JavaFX. And you yourself can try that. How are you going to take all the data and map it and plot it and things like that? And JavaFX would be one of those platforms built on top of Java that allow you to do that. So in summary, what I have to say here, what we have to say here is that data is the new oil of the 21st century. Uh, data is growing exponentially. Um, look out uh, for data science as the next field of big data analytics. In fact, what I have found is if you actually put the word data scientist in your resume, you know, you can actually get 10 or 20K pay raise. Um, so you might want to do that. But on a serious note, this is, this is where the next generation of computing is going on. This is where the next generation you know, gener of information technology engineers are going to be coming into play. And you know, when I talk about data science to people, they say, oh, yeah, you know, we do that in Python. We write these Perl scripts. You know, I have some students of mine that work at J Johns Hopkins University who do you know, data science, data analytics using Perl for gene, gene systems and things. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, there's a great technology that's available over here that you can do. In fact, they're doing that. They, they, those guys are actually turning into this. So we have Apache Hadoop. Uh, we have Hadoop distributed file system where you can store terabytes, petabytes of the data. Hadoop map reduced for batch processing. Pig and High for data warehouse, data analytics uh, that generates MapReduce code, HBase and Cassandra for real-time data access, Mahout, JSF, JFX, all these different technologies that's available out there. That's all we have to say. Thank you very much. And